question as we come on the air. When is the air going to get easier to breathe? With that dangerous smoke now choking the mid-Atlantic, making a mess of flights as the U.S. sends crews up to Canada to try to fight those fires at their source. We'll take you live to Montreal and to Philly. Also tonight, in literally the last hour, the suspect in the Natalie Holloway murder case is back in the U.S., where Jorn van der Sloot is now and what we're learning is next for him. Plus, spidey senses tingling over a potential Donald Trump indictment related to classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago, what he's just saying in the last 25 minutes. Then, why Google is going beyond pizza parties to try and get people back into the office, what we know about their new crackdown on working from home, and what it might say about your office, too. And a new drug could help treat an addiction that might sometimes fly under the radar. We'll talk about the cannabis connection a little later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And right now, it is here in D.C. and the Mid-Atlantic in the bullseye of that thick smog making the air unhealthy to breathe for nearly 100 million of us and tangling up flights for a second day in a row. Look how orange it is here in Scranton, Pennsylvania. That's top left. That's really in the center of it all. You got Baltimore, Maryland, Washington, D.C. So much haze with places facing code red, code purple, even code maroon. That's the worst one, meaning it's just straight up hazardous. Take a live look at the airport in Philly. The city's air quality today, the worst it's been since the city started keeping records. They don't have a record of it ever being worse than it is right now. You've got some airlines letting people waive change fees if they have to push back flights to or from the airports dealing with major delays. Here in D.C., schools are calling off anything outside. In New York, schools will go remote tomorrow because of how bad the air is. The Smithsonian National Zoo closed. You got more Major League Baseball games canceled. Even the White House postponing its outdoor pride celebration, with the focus now turning to fighting this air quality issue at its source, those huge wildfires up in Canada, because they just don't seem to be getting better. And Canada apparently doesn't have enough firefighters or resources to get a handle on this thing. President Biden today says he wants any available federal firefighting help to head north across the border. He wants our government to keep a close eye on air quality and air traffic. We have Lindsay Riser, who will get to out in the thick of it in a second, along with meteorologist Bill Karens and a report from one of our partner stations in Canada. I want to get to Lindsay first. It is Philly. It is D.C. where things are bad. The worst in 24 years uh, in some spots, right? Talk about the situation in the East Coast, in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, flights also a mess. Yeah, and Hallie, things were bad here in New York City, the worst in decades. I'm actually feeling some drizzle here. People are relieved that we are not seeing that orange haze developing the city like we did yesterday. But the air quality index is still high, still unhealthy for all groups. So it's supposed to be around 50. Right now, it's around 168. And yesterday, at around 4 p.m. Eastern, it peaked in the 400. So incredibly high. But you're mentioning, right, the other places along the East Coast that are impacted. So the area is seeing the worst of it. Pennsylvania, D.C., Delaware, Connecticut now in the thick of it. And it has this ripple effect. So you mentioned um, schools being closed. In New Jersey, Elizabeth and Newark, they canceled schools today. Also, we saw Yonkers cancel school. Broadway shows postponed last night because of this. I talked to tourists who were really upset that they had these tickets um, that they had to forego. And so when we talk about what we can expect, the good news is we are expecting these, the, this air quality index tomorrow to be unhealthy still, but for sensitive groups instead of everybody. So those include areas like New York, D.C., and Philadelphia, Hallie. Lindsay Reiser, live for us there in New York. Lindsay, thank you very much. Obviously, as we said, the focus is turning to how to stop these fires at the source. That would obviously help stop the smoke. I want to get to Vanessa Lee of our partner CTV in Montreal with a look at that. There are currently 133 fires raging in Quebec with more than half out of control. This has affected at least 11,000 people who have been forced to flee their homes. Officials say their focus today is on a village seven hours north of Montreal. It's called Normetal. It's a small community of 800 people where flames are literally at their doorstep, just 500 meters away. And so all efforts are being made right now to save this small community. The concern, of course, is when people will be able to go home. A couple of days ago, 7,500 people from the town of Shibugamo were evacuated. And really, it happened very quickly. 
The town councillor was told at 5 o'clock that the town would be safe, and just a couple of hours later, they were told they had to leave, that they started banging on people's doors, telling them to leave immediately. And they don't know when they'll be able to go back because there is no rain in the forecast until next Tuesday. It's unprecedented to see so many fires this early in the season. So far in Quebec, there have been 444 fires. Normally at this time of the season, it's only about 200. There are 800 firefighters right now on the ground across the province with more help on the way from abroad. There are firefighters coming from the U.S., from Spain, Portugal, and France. And the reason they're coming from so far away is because there have been so many fires right across Canada that most provinces can't spare the resources. And there are fears over what's to come, considering summer hasn't even arrived yet. Vanessa Lee in Montreal for NBC News. I want to get to meteorologist Bill Karens now. Okay, the thing people want to know, Bill, right? <laughs> when is it going to clear up? When is this going to get better? Uh, Saturday is when a lot of people will be able to go outside, see the blue skies, take a you know, deep breath of fresh air and uh, feel a little better about things. But it won't be completely over with. And that's because the fires are still going to be there. So anytime the winds turn in the wrong direction and blow that smoke towards the United States, we're going to have to deal with it. And so even now, we still have a smoke in the sky all the way areas to the south. When you get that sunset, you'll notice that little orangey tint. But the really heavy stuff is in the mid-Atlantic region. It was worse this morning. We've hit our our peak in almost all areas. So that's the good news. It's starting to improve in New York City. It's still in the red for the unhealthy category from Philadelphia to Central PA all the way through Washington, D.C. Our numbers peaked about 300 this morning in many areas from D.C. into Harrisburg. At one point, we were in a 400 in Central Pennsylvania. I know Bethlehem, Pennsylvania was one of the highest 24-hour averages anywhere in the country. So it was really unprecedented and historic. And now some areas that were bad are getting better. So some cooler, drier air is coming in. So everyone wants to know, and this is something new to a lot of people, is that we actually can tell you the smoke forecast. This isn't the clouds. This is just to tell you where the smoke's going to go. So the fires are up here. The smoke's blowing down right now towards the Great Lakes, towards Buffalo and Erie, and then it's blowing down through the mid-Atlantic. So by the time you wake up tomorrow morning from about New York City northwards, we should have blue skies or cloudy skies, depending. But all the smoke should be Philadelphia down to about Norfolk, Virginia Beach and across Pennsylvania. And notice even Detroit and Cleveland getting into the mix. Even Chicago at this hour is reporting some hazy skies and smoke. Now, it's not like New York City yesterday, but it's still there. And then by 6 p.m., unfortunately, if you have still in the Washington, D.C. area, it's really not until we get into Saturday that everything starts breaking up a little bit more. But notice even Buffalo and western New York, still some persistent smoke. And that's because we have to get rid of these fires. Fires. We just heard how many fires there are, about 235 burning out of control. Here's Quebec, and this is the area all the smoke is coming from. We need it to rain. It's so remote, it's very difficult for firefighters to get in there and put them all out. The rainfall forecast over the next week only calls for maybe an inch to maybe an inch and a half, Hallie. That is not enough rain to put those fires no. out. We need it to soak. We need it to pour, and that's yeah. not going to happen. They would want to see a different forecast there. There's also this question now as we look at the climate connection to this yeah. bill, as you often do, as to why the alarm wasn't sounded more loudly earlier about the potential for something like this to happen, right? There's some criticism now against the city of New York that maybe they should have warned people more forcefully, et cetera. You know, it's also something where New York is used to, let's say, weather events like hurricanes right. or whatever. California is not is used to wildfires. This is an inversion, I think, of what we would typically see. I think it's right that we can criticize that there should be procedures in place in these areas for schools and for events and municipalities. What happens if you have dense wildfire smoke? And I think that'll happen after this event, because a lot of those just weren't in place because the last time this happened was 20 years ago, a generation. But one thing you can't critique is because these fires really didn't start until June 1st and 2nd. That's when there was a lot of lightning strikes up here in areas of Quebec. And we really didn't see the huge flare up until about the 3rd, maybe even on the 4th. So they only had about two days notice that this thick plume was heading. And it's something we'd never seen before. I mean, I even saw it on our computers. I mean, we, I was telling people, I think tomorrow is going to be worse. And that was, you know, the day before yesterday. And but until I actually saw it myself, I wasn't going to go there running up and down the street telling everyone it's going to look like Mars because it was one of those things that you kind of had to see it to believe it. Yeah. And also, you, you don't want to be wrong on something like that, no. too, Bill. Right. You don't be the boy, the boy that cried Mars. That's not <laughs> what you want. Uh, Bill Karens, thank you very yeah. much. More to come on this story for sure. More to come to on this whole indictment watch we've been on. Right. Shake up that magic eight ball. 
it may say signs point to yes, not a definite yes, but signals suggesting that former President Trump could soon face federal charges. We don't know what specifically those charges would be, but it will be connected to the special counsel investigation that accuses him of taking classified documents improperly, illegally back to his home in Mar-a-Lago. If you're like, Hallie, why do you think we know this? Like, what, what do you mean signs point to yes? What are those signs? Here's one. You see this guy here? That's one of the top deputies for special counsel Jack Smith, a guy named David Harbach. He's down at a Florida federal court where a grand jury is meeting today, according to sources. Signal one. Let's talk about signal two, right? Our team now hearing that the Justice Department has told Mr. Trump he is a target in this investigation. Why does that matter? When you hear that you're a target, it means prosecutors think you committed a crime. You usually find out with a letter that says, hey, come on down and talk with the grand jury. Something Mr. Trump is almost certainly not going to do, but... Whether he does or not, people who get these letters often get indicted, whether or not they testify. Remember why we're here. The FBI found hundreds of classified documents at the former president's home, even though his lawyers said he gave them all back. So how is he responding today? Well, in just the last 20 minutes or so, he's calling it a boxes hoax on a radio show. Plus, he's out with his truth social with a very, we should say, very unsubstantiated claim against one of the prosecutors at the Justice Department, claiming that they've been bribed. He's basing it off a right-wing report. NBC News can't confirm it. Laura Jarrett is joining us now. We have laid out now, Laura, right, the speculation, the reasons why there is some speculation here, and that it's not just noise with no signal. Help us understand where things actually are as it relates to the timeline. It's informed speculation, Hallie, because Fair. you're following what is the typical course in an investigation like this. And in the typical case, the meeting that Trump's lawyers had at the Justice Department would come at the end of the investigation, as you and I discussed. And we've now learned, my colleague Adam Reese and I have confirmed, that at that meeting, Trump's attorneys were informed that prosecutors view him as a target. That's a big deal. The former president of the United States is viewed as having committed a federal crime. That is significant. As you said, it doesn't mean that he's going to be charged. We don't even know what those charges would be. But the fact that they view him that way and convey that information to his attorneys is meaningful. It's something to pay attention. We do not know what is going on down there in Florida. But the fact that that witness went in yesterday and yet the special counsel team is still there on the ground should tell us something. Why is the spotlight now on Florida instead of D.C. here? We think it's possibly because in order for prosecutors to bring charges, they have to bring it in the venue, in the place where at least part of the crime took place. And as we know, in this case, it's all about the fact that these documents were moved from Washington, D.C. to Florida. How they got there, how they were retained, why they moved from an office to a storage facility, whether the former president instructed anyone to do that and why he did it, those are all questions that have to do with things that happened in Florida. And so it makes a lot of sense if prosecutors want to avoid a fight about venue, if they want to avoid the former president's defense attorneys filing a bunch of pretrial motions trying to get the case thrown out, that they would bring it in Florida and take the wind out of all of that. Why are why is Mr. Trump's legal team bringing up this idea of prosecutorial misconduct? One of his ex-attorneys thinks that that's how they're going to try to get this case dismissed. What is up with that? Is there any evidence to suggest that? Is this a legal strategy or a political one more than a legal one? No, and honestly, I, I really am hesitant to even repeat this because there's so no evidence for this. It's so baseless um, that I think that this is what is a familiar playbook, which is to go on to the attack preemptively before there have even been any charges so that his followers will say this whole thing is politically yeah. tainted. And there's no evidence that the Justice Department engaged in misconduct. And if there were, it would come out. And you almost will be sure that we will find out about it because we will keep digging. And it's not that he doesn't have a right to a defense. It's not that he doesn't have the right to try to assert everything he can uh, to marshal facts in his favor. But he doesn't get to make baseless allegations uh, and just lob them out there without anything to back it up. Laura, Jared, thank you for being all over it. Uh, we may talk again sometime yes. very soon. Appreciate it, We're Laura. We're ready. Thanks. Some pretty intense fighting now in Ukraine as the country launches, it seems, this long-awaited counteroffensive against Russia. Basically, this is Ukraine stepping up its attacks against the Kremlin's invasion. You can see on this map, the red is what Russia is occupying. Ukraine wants it back. It's happening as the British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, meets with President Biden today to talk partly about military help, right? The help that both of these countries are giving Ukraine. I believe we'll have the funding. 
necessary to support Ukraine as long as it takes. And uh, I believe that uh, we're going to that that support will be real, even though there are you hear some voices today on Capitol Hill about whether or not we should continue. Peter Alexander is going to join us with more from the White House in just a second. But I want to get right to Raf Sanchez, who is live in Ukraine for us tonight. A pivotal moment, Raf, a key moment in this counteroffensive. We're in it now. Where does it go? A key moment, Hallie, and a major, major test for Ukraine. The Ukrainian forces are flush with Western weapons. They have spent months planning, training, preparing for this counteroffensive. But this may also be really their bat last best chance to make significant gains on the battlefield. A senior Ukrainian officer and a soldier near the front lines here in Zaporizhia tells us the counteroffensive is underway. They would not go into detail about where exactly Ukraine is attacking, what their objectives are. But we do know that some of the most intense fighting is happening east of where we are, further on into Zaporizhia. It appears there, according to analysts we have spoken to, that for the first time, Ukraine is sending Western battle tanks into combat. Yeah. These are these German-made Leopard 2 tanks. And that is a sign of how seriously they are taking it, that they are finally, after months of holding them back, deploying their best weapons onto the battlefield. Hallie? How does that dam collapse play into this counteroffensive push, if at all, Raf? So the Ukrainians have been saying all week that even as they deal with this humanitarian and environmental disaster all across southern Ukraine, they will not allow it to interfere with the counteroffensive. And they appear to be delivering on that promise. Remember, Ukraine says the Russians blew up this dam on the Dnieper River to try to prevent this counteroffensive from going forward, stop Ukrainian troops crossing the river, create absolute chaos. The Russians are denying that they are responsible. We have not yet heard the U.S. weigh in definitively one way or another, but U.S. officials say the intelligence is leaning towards Russia being responsible. And Halley, this evacuation effort in the city of Kherson still underway. As it happens, rescuers there are under fire from Russian units on the other side of the river. President Zelensky also making a visit to Kherson today. That is not a trip without risk for the president of Ukraine. Just a couple of hours after yeah. he was at one of these evacuation points, it was shelled there. They say they've evacuated about 2,000 people from the Ukrainian-controlled side of the river, but they're very worried about civilians in Russian-occupied areas who Ukraine says are basically being left to fend for themselves. Hallie. Raf Sanchez, live for us there in Ukraine. Raf, thank you. Let me bring in Peter Alexander now. And Peter, this is the backdrop, right, what Raf is laying out. To the visuals of this meeting of these two allies, allies of Ukraine, they're in the Oval Office of the White House together, in the East Room of the White House together, promising to keep helping until Ukraine wins this war. Hallie, you're right. We heard from these two leaders, as the president said, um, reiterating their unwavering support of Ukraine right now, more than a year into this war. And at this crucial time frame, as you note, the start of that counteroffensive that everyone in the world, frankly, certainly the Russians and Ukrainians have been anticipating to take mm -hmm. place beginning this spring and likely to last into the summer. President Biden was asked about this issue. And in his words, he said he was, quote, very optimistic about the evolving situation there. You played the sound bite in the introduction to this conversation about the president said, among other, thing, uh, among other things, that he had confidence that Congress would provide additional funding going forward to support the war effort in Ukraine, despite those divisions among Republicans uh, right now. It was Rishi Sunak, the prime minister of the UK, who said, among other things, that it's Vladimir Putin who is trying to divide the West, basically, the US and its allies, that Vladimir Putin is trying to wait them out in this war. And he said that's not going to happen, that we will be there as long as it takes. So those are some of the key takeaways on this issue right now, specifically to the attack on the dam in southern Ukraine that is suspected perhaps to have been um, perpetrated by the Russians. President Biden was asked about it. He didn't have a specific answer about that attack, but we did hear from the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who said at least that it was too early to determine how and who that was committed by. Hallie. Peter Alexander, live for us here on the North Lawn of the White House. Peter, good to see you. Thank you very much. So listen, you're about to see what we think is the man long suspected of having something to do with Natalie Holloway's disappearance. 
back in the United States late today. There it is, right? We think that's Jorn van der Sloot in Alabama after he was extradited from Peru. He's set to be in court tomorrow. This is a shot looking at him getting into the motorcade there in Birmingham. He's going to head to a jail. So much attention on this moment and on him generally. He was getting swarmed by media as his motorcade searches. Instead, it's fraud. He'll face allegations that he got Holloway's mother to wire him $25,000 in exchange for information on where her body was, a promise he supposedly never delivered on. Holloway's disappearance was a massive story in 2005. She was last seen getting into a car. Two ago, that his arraignment is going to be tomorrow at 11 o'clock local time. In terms of how we got here, Vandersloot committed murder in Peru back in 2010. He was serving a 28-year-long sentence alley, and just this past May, the Peruvian government, after 13 years, decided to grant its blessing to extradite Vandersloot to the United States, and that sort of set this whole process in motion. There was always a question of whether or not he would fight the extradition. His attorney did ultimately try and do that. Peruvian Superior Court said, nope, we have not violated your rights. You're going to the United States, and he is now facing, as you said, two counts related to Natalie Holloway's disappearance, but not about the disappearance or murder per se. This is actually about wire fraud and extortion, extortion in the sense that he asked, according to authorities, their family for $250,000 to provide details about where they could find Natalie Holloway's body, which, of course, was never actually delivered. So there's the fraud, and it was done, I am told by the former U.S. attorney here in Alabama that actually signed off on those indictments, Joyce Vance. It was done because he did this all over email, written communication. That is what made it wire fraud. And then the other part of this extortion, of course, is just the, the potential fear that he could have been creating by asking for this demand. That's why it fits under extortion. She said it's a little bit complicated, but each charge, alley carries up to 20 years behind bars, which is, of course, a substantial period of time for someone who is already serving a nearly 30-year-long sentence right. in Peru for murder, Hallie. Holloway's body has never been found. She was declared legally dead by a judge back in 2012. You have right. laid out the extortion and wire fraud charges. Um, is there any chance those at all, Sam, end up becoming something that is more closely related to her disappearance and presumed death? Is there any chance it helps her family, even just by having court proceedings with Vandersloot in the United States, get some of the answers that they so desperately want? Yeah, and, and so bear with me. There's some emergency sirens going on in the background here. It's a little bit loud. But I don't think you're going to see a situation where those charges are elevated to murder without a body, right? That ship, it appears, has sort of sailed. But in terms of what this means for the family, we did hear from Beth Holloway actually a statement just within the last hour or so. She said that, and her family's attorney said, that it has been an 18-year-long wait where they've been hoping and praying and fighting for some semblance of justice. And Beth Holloway says this does to her represent justice. She'll never feel fully whole again, of course, given the tragedy she's absorbed. But this is a step in the right direction. Can you tell us what it's been like, Sam, as you've been in Birmingham, as, as you've been in Alabama there, um, given, again, we saw the media attention on Vandersloot just in Peru. I think it's hard for people who weren't sort of paying attention to the news back in 2005. I was candidly in college at the time. I remember hearing a ton about it, right? I mean, this was like a, a trip to Aruba. It was a huge story. I mean, the, the world was watching this. What's it like where you are? Yeah, for the record, I was also in college, and so that just really makes me feel good that we were seeing this through the same lens and period of yeah. time. In terms of how people were absorbing it or are absorbing it right now in Birmingham, between shock and apoplexy, when someone comes up to me and says, what are you guys doing out on the street corner? And I explain, oh, you know, Joran Vandersloot is actually coming here. Like, Who? The Natalie Holloway guy? Yeah, that guy. Um, it has been sort of burned into everyone's memory here. It absolutely took over the town, and it created this massive emotional weight on the people who live here. Of course, Holloway is from... Birmingham. And so there's a lot of surprise right now, but people really feeling a sense of, of satisfaction that there's going to be some sort of grinding of justice. The wheels are finally turning, even if it's been almost two decades. Sam Brock, live for us there in Birmingham. Sam, thank you very much. Coming up, the Supreme Court out with a whole bunch of rulings today, including one big win for Jack Daniels. We'll talk about that next. Plus, El Nino is officially here. Why officials say it could be the warmest year on record in the five things. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the conservative evan evangelist and media mogul Pat Robertson. He is dead. He founded the Christian Broadcasting Network, which revolutionized the business of TV preaching. He was largely responsible for politically mobilizing the Christian right wing 
with his group, the Christian Coalition. He was 93 years old. He is dead at the age of 93. Number two, the Vatican says Pope Francis is in good condition today after that three-hour surgery to fix a hernia yesterday. He rested a lot last night, but today he's apparently alert. He's breathing on his own. He'll spend a few more days in the hospital while he recovers. And number three, Louisiana just passed a new bill that would require kids under the age of 18 to get their parents' permission before signing up for accounts online. The state's governor still would have to sign this thing into law. But it would mean that for social media sites, for gaming sites, a kid would need a parent or a caregiver to go ahead and give them that permission. Other conservative states like Utah and Arkansas have similar laws. Number four, El Nino is officially here, according to NOAA, the first time in about four years that we're going to see this weather pattern. What does it mean as, ne as El Nino gets stronger and stronger? It means get ready for it to get hot, right? Potentially record temperature. Seven years, it usually means fewer hurricanes in the Gulf Coast in Florida, but more hurricanes out in the Pacific. Number five, the Supreme Court siding with Jack Daniels in a trademark fight over a, frankly, poop-themed dog toy that looks just like a Jack Daniels bottle. It's called Bad Spaniels. The company that makes it says, hey, we're a parody, like we're protected by the First Amendment. Jack Daniels said, no, it's too close to our trademark. In a 9-0 ruling, a unanimous ruling, the court ruled against the dog toy company. Viva la Jack Daniels. Also out of the Supreme Court, civil and voting rights activists are celebrating a different decision tonight after the court struck down congressional maps in Alabama, which opponents said essentially scaled back the power of black voters in the state. The five to four decision was a shocker, right? This was a twist because it backs the landmark 1965 Voting Rights Act, even as the conservative court has recently issued rulings that seem to strike down key parts of it or that did. You see two more conservative justices joining the liberal justices in this in this. Alabama now has to go back to the drawing board. They have to give black voters more say in the state's election, considering black people make up more than a quarter of the state's population. NBC's Julia Ainsley is covering this for us. And two big pieces to this, right? It's a twist. It was a surprise. People didn't expect it. But more importantly, the court basically said, no, Alabama, you did dilute the power of the black vote. And you can't do that. That's right. And going forward, what this means is that the bar is not raised. When states try to gerrymander and rig these voting maps so that they dilute any population, they no longer have to be intentional about being racist and anyone who's challenging them, they don't have to prove that those maps were intentionally racist. They just have to have the effect of racism. That's a big deal for people who are challenging voting maps in their states going forward. I was just going to ask then, does this open the door perhaps to more optimism on the part of people who are bringing those challenges? They don't necessarily have quite as high a bar to prove. Yes. I mean, there is some good news, but I think we should also have a grain of salt here. There's a line today that we saw in the majority opinion that did strike my eye where they said that Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, that's what they're upholding, yep. may impermissibly elevate race in the allocation of political power within the United States. In other in other words, they don't want to get carried away here. They are going to uphold it in this case, and they do think that Alabama was in violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, but they don't want to elevate race past the point where they would deem it permissible. So what does Alabama have to do now? So now they've got to go back to the drawing board, as you said, and they have to listen to groups like the black voters yeah. that challenged this and other voters that challenged it. And they now need to have them give them a voice when they're coming up with these different maps. Pull back a little bit because it's not just Alabama, right? The court is looking at a lot that has to do with race, that has to do with voting rights. What is the landscape here? Yeah, it was really interesting today because as some are breathing a sigh of relief, there's still a number of decisions coming forward that do have to do with voting that could still go the other way. Also, looking back, I mean, we know in 2013, the Supreme Court released 15 states from federal oversight of voting laws. They upheld Arizona's voting restrictions. Right. There are a lot of ways looking back that this court often led by our current Chief Justice John Roberts, did actually roll back the clock on some of those voting rights that were in place. Julia Ainsley, thank you very much. For Thanks, Hallie. I appreciate the breakdown. When we come back, new details tonight over just how divided Americans are over gender identity. Wait until you see some of these numbers. Nobody's hurt, but a bunch of expensive stuff got wrecked when a freight train derailed in Arizona. We'll tell you what it was carrying later on in the local. But first, there's this new national poll out today showing just how divided people are, not over politics, 
necessarily, but over gender identity. It shows that two thirds of Americans believe there are just two gender identities, man, woman. Look at the political breakdown of that, right? 90% of Republicans say that, 66% of independents, fewer than half of Democrats, though. I want to bring in Aaron Gilchrist for more on this. And there may be people going, well, wait a second, I don't understand this, right? Why is this even a conversation? What do people say about this? And how did the divide get so deep? We talked to a couple of experts about this, and part of it is, is that there hasn't really been yeah, you know, decades of conversation around this. So it's sort of new for some people to even be talking about this. But for this particular survey, you know, they sort of explained it as this is where political affiliation plays a role, mm -hmm. trust in news sources plays a role, and generation, you know, what generation you're in plays a role in terms of how people responded to these questions. And these experts we talked to kind of pointed to this intersection of politics and, and culture and religion uh, around these LGBTQ issues in particular, and the notion that we're sort of born with this understanding of gender norms, right? At least for generations, that's been the case. And, and if we're not born with it, you're sort of socialized into it. And the idea being, right, I mean, I think that we've got to just say clearly here, sex and gender being yeah. two different things. Right, and, and that's a whole other conversation. Right, exactly. Yeah, yes, right. But, but around gender identity now, we, we are having conversations in a way that we did not 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And, you know, if you look at some of the numbers from this survey, the fact that you've got 65% uh, of, of people saying there are just two genders, that means you've got 35 35 percent of people who are saying, no, there's there's more room for this part of the conversation. There's a spectrum. Right? right. So politics plays a part of it. And then there's this idea that there are some people who are saying, you know what, this is a much more complex thing than two genders. And so there's more conversation to be had around it. There's more understanding. I want you to hear what how one of our experts put it uh, in terms of explaining how we got to the sort of space that we are in now. Those of us in universities and perhaps in media are a little bit more familiar uh, with these topics and issues, but a lot of Americans are encountering them for the first time, and um, the, the issues around um, gender and gender identity are big ones, and people are trying to make sense of them. So people are trying to make sense of it. There are some people in, in this professor's estimation who, who are not able to or willing to have the conversation and try to understand sort of what the possibilities are around gender identity. And then there are others who are saying, yeah, let's have the conversation. There's an opportunity for some people to learn, to be educated about what 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 the what, gender spectrum is right. and what and that looks like. Exactly. Right. And, and that's partly because of Gen Z that's out there saying, hey, you know what, yeah. there's more conversation to be had, let's do it. Uh, and they're helping to sort of drive that conversation uh, in a way that we hadn't seen with previous generations. That's a great point on the generational aspect of it. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you very much. Yeah. Good to see you. You too. Coming up, new video of this man. Where do you see it? Great white shark, people on a fishing trip. We're going to show you the rest of it. Look at that. We'll tell you where they spotted this thing. Plus, some big companies want their workers back in the office. What they're doing, not to say please, but to say do it or else. I'll tell you. NBC News is learning tonight that the U.S. is pressing pause on sending food to Ethiopia. Why? Not because it's not needed, but because this countrywide review found a widespread and coordinated campaign to divert that food away from people in the country. It means that the folks who need it the most are not getting it. USAID says this internal investigation found that food for millions of people was essentially being stolen, telling NBC News in a statement that we made the difficult but necessary decision that we cannot move forward with distribution of this food aid until there are changes. This is bad news for the people who need help in Ethiopia because the U.S. is the biggest humanitarian aid donor to the country of any other country in the world. I want to bring in Matt Bradley for more on this. Hey, Matt, good evening. Hey, good evening, Hallie. So, yeah, that uh, that widespread investigation by USAID throughout Ethiopia found that in most of the regions there was this coordinated campaign. That was the language that they used. And they found that it was coordinated on the federal level and on the local level and that much of this grain much of this food that had been donated by the United States, and we're talking about $1.8 billion in aid, most of, which, most of which was food aid, and about $480 million or something around there was given by USAID. A lot of this was diverted from the people who need it most, and not just 
out necessarily into the open market, but it was going directly to benefiting the military, which had been involved in a two-year campaign in the northern Tigray region. Now, you know, Hallie, when we talk about what this, kind, this country is facing, I mean, we're talking about multiple different problems uh, really facing it, both from within and from without. There was that war, that two-year-long war, and you might think, you might be forgiven for thinking that the worst war we've seen in the world in recent decades has been in Ukraine. But no, actually, the most lethal war has been in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. 600,000 people dead in just two years, and with the military of Ethiopia accused of widespread rape and human rights abuses throughout that region. It ended back in November with a settlement, but Human Rights Watch has said that a lot of the violence there is still going on, and that's why some 90% of people in that northern part of the country, the Tigray region, are really in need of food aid. But the food aid by USAID had already been suspended more than a month ago to that region because of the same kind of thing, widespread fraud that was diverting the food from those who need it most and giving it to people like the military who were profiting off of it. Now, this investigation yeah. found that this profit had been done in several different ways. One way was that it was just simply being used, being sold on the open market, again, to benefit the military. So it was the military people and local and government officials who were pocketing the cash. Some of it was being sold to neighboring countries like Kenya and, uh, and Somalia. And this way, they were also being able to pocket some of the money. So the fact is, is that this country is also experiencing, and the countries in the region, one of the longest periods of drought that it's ever suffered in the past several decades. So we're talking about conflict. We're talking about drought. We're also talking about swarms of locusts and refugees pouring in from conflicts in neighboring mm. Somalia and in Sudan. So this is a country that is really caught in such a vice grip of tragedy. And now we're seeing USAID suspending its donations of food. So that's going to have a really horrible effect on the civilians there who really need this most. Alex. And the thinking is that's got to stay suspended, right, this food assistance until there are changes, until there are reforms. Are reforms even possible? What would that take? Well, this is the thing is that, you know, there's a political game here. And this is the, the United States doesn't want to antagonize Abiy Ahmed, who's the main, who's the, you know, the, the leader of uh, Ethiopia. They need him on side in order to try to, you know, try to reach people, try to distribute food and try to ensure that this conflict doesn't restart. But at the same time, they can't continue to give food to organizations and governments that are going to be using it to, you know, pocket the money uh, or defraud those donors. So it's really, uh, it's a really a tough position for USAID, and that's why we saw that language used by Samantha Powers last month and others saying that this was such a reluctant decision. Where do you draw the line when it comes to helping people, even if you know that some of this money, some of this food is going to get stolen, there still needs to be this effort to try to bring food to people, and that's what a lot of officials in the U.S. and USAID were grappling with. Hallie. Matt Bradley, thank you very much for that important update tonight. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, look at this. This great white... I can't even say it because it's so bananas. A great white shark... This, this is right up to people fishing just off the Jersey Shore. They caught a fish. The great white shark comes up, tries to bite it. They're, like, shocked. This is after four great whites were spotted near New York and New Jersey around Memorial Day. Shark's going to shark, man. Out of our Western Bureau, check it out. This freight train that derailed in Arizona carrying a bunch of cars that got crushed. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. Cleanup has already begun, but you can see what is left of some of those cars. Also out of our Western Bureau, take a live look here. This is the Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii, one of the most active volcanoes in the world. We talked about this 24 hours ago, how this thing started erupting after being dormant for three months. Today, officials say they're lowering the alert from warning back down to watch. They say the eruption is expected to keep going, but that the lava is not going to get much past the crater. That is a bit of good news for folks there. So listen, Google is planning to crack down on employees who haven't been coming into the office on the reg. This is according to CNBC, first out with this story. We understand that the hybrid work policy for Google now includes tracking your attendance through your badge. Workers who are not coming in when they're supposed to get confronted. That includes the attendance and employees' performance reviews. So if you don't come in, you could end up like officially docked for that. The, what they call chief people officer at Google, aka like the head HR person, in an email says, listen, there's just no substitute for coming together in person. Asterisk, star on that. We'll come back to it. 
This whole push to return to the office has probably been in your group chats at some point, probably in your side slacks, too. Even Martha Stewart has had something to say about it. Listen. I cannot really stomach another Zoom, you know, yeah. Zoom here, Zoom there. Uh, it just doesn't get the work done in the right way. Now, we're, our, our, our office is on a three-day work week, uh -huh. and, and I just don't agree with it. I want to bring in Jake Ward, who joins us now. Fine, Jake. On the one side, Google and Martha Stewart. On the other side, a ton of employees who are like, I don't care if you don't like Zoom. This is working for my life. What's interesting about this Google move is that we've seen so far, if you think about carrots and sticks, lots of carrots to get people to come back to the office. The ice cream truck, the happy hour, right? Google's pulling out the stick. I think that's absolutely right, Hallie. You know, and, and Martha probably runs a hell of a Zoom meeting, but but there, you know, it's not at all clear uh, the degree to which these companies uh, can actually bring these people back and keep them motivated. But they certainly can bring them back. You know, uh, the, what we're seeing here from this internal reporting uh, that's come out of CNBC, which got its hands on internal memos there, you know, really shows that Google is trying to wind the clock back, at least to some extent, toward February 2020, the last time that we were all working a, a normal life. Uh, they want people in the office for that three-day-a-week policy, and they're prepared to start uh, some enforcement on it. You know, uh, we've seen this, of course, uh, from other companies. Uh, you know, we have uh, Meta last week announcing that by September, people should really be committed to their three-day-a-week schedule. Elon Musk at Twitter is famously hostile to working from home. He's been open about it. But even Mark Benioff, the head of Salesforce, who once upon a time was all for it and told people they could work wherever they wanted, is now talking about wanting new employees to be in the office at least four days a week. So there's just this general sense that companies here in San Francisco and around the country are trying to wind the clock back to something like the life we used to live. Is there any data to support the idea that being in person can help companies collaborate? I was struck by something that that Google chief people officer said, which was an acknowledgement that nobody thinks that these magical hallway meetings are really going to sprinkle fairy dust on everything, right? But she was pointing to basically saying, yeah, there are actual benefits to this. Do we know that that's the case from a data perspective? You know, we do know that there is, uh, at least from a pure, like, t getting tasks done perspective, the organizational psychologists would all tell you that there's pretty good evidence that putting people together, making sure they have relationships, and sticking them on tasks together makes them more productive than having them at a distance from one another. But the other, you know, the, the more progressive sort of hybrid uh, experts that I've been speaking to also say that we are just beginning to figure out how to make a hybrid uh, system work out. It may not be that you want to sit on a Zoom with Martha day in and day out, but it may be that there are other ways to get people together in a hybrid format that makes them just as effective, maybe more effective. We know, of course, that it cuts a huge amount of time and expense out of people's right. lives to keep them from having to commute into the office. But I think a lot of the senior management pushing back toward this thing has to do with the fact that most of the established research is about working in person, and that's probably what they're basing this decision on. I don't know if you would have the answer to this, Jake, but I do wonder what there could be relating to legal pushback on something like this, right? In other words, do employee protections mm -hmm. extend to the hybrid workplace if, in fact, your company told you you could do that, now they shift their position? Could a worker fight that? Like, I don't know, because the answer could also be, well, find another job. That's your other option. Well, this is really interesting. I mean, I think, yes, you probably could see some legal challenges if you have some sort of signed document that you, that says, you know, you get to work from anywhere from now on. Google made that sort of offer to lots and lots of people during the pandemic yeah. and allowed them to go work in any place they wanted to. That's part of why that chief people officer's email is, in fact, uh, saying to people who took that kind of arrangement and signed that kind of deal that she hopes you will reconsider the arrangement. <laughs> and uh, internally, another memo is there says that Google has the right to reconsider the arrangement depending on what kind of values they have. But yeah, that could absolutely wind up in court if somebody decided to press it, Hallie. Jake Ward in our San Francisco office tonight. Jake, thank you. I think. Jake, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Still to come. A new kind of drug shows some promise in treating cannabis addiction. We'll talk about not just how it works, but what does cannabis addiction even look like anyway? What's next? <laughs> A new experimental drug tonight shows positive results for treating cannabis addiction. You may be thinking, well, wait a second, what even is that? Because can you even get addicted to cannabis in the first place? Is there such thing as pot addiction? There sure is. 
and experts say that there is a growing need to do something about it because 14 million Americans struggled with what's called cannabis use disorder in 2021, according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. This comes at a time when 23 states plus D.C. and Guam have legalized recreational cannabis, making it more widely available. Dr. Akshay Sayal is joining us now. So let me just sort of start big picture. I think people have this perspective. You can't get addicted to pot, right? There's no such thing. Like, it's, you know, relatively harmless here. There is such thing as cannabis addiction. Explain it. There is, and you're absolutely right. People don't seem to realize this. I think marijuana so far seems to have a very benign reputation, meaning people aren't really thinking about the harms as we continue to legalize it. And as more and more people continue to use it, Hallie, the, the, our young adults in this country actually reach record highs, according to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, in terms of how much marijuana is being used. Um, so what does addiction look like? What does it mean? Um, so whenever we talk about substance use disorders, we're talking about, you know, are these disorders interfering with your ability to do things? And we're talking about interfering with school and work, changes in relationships, giving up things you used to do that you used to love and you just can't seem to do those things anymore. So when you're using cannabis or marijuana or using even alcohol or opiates at a point where it starts to interfere with these things, that's when we get the disorder and that's when we have a real problem. It should also be noted that the issue of the addictive properties of cannabis, right, or any substance, probably separate from the issue of whether something should be legalized. And I say that I'm not as an advocate for either position, but just to say there is such thing as alcohol abuse. And obviously, alcohol is a legal substance to purchase in this country. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've talked to m many, many addiction specialists over the last month about this, and the, the, nobody seems to be against legalization. I think that's pretty pretty set. Um, the concern is, are we going to legalize it correctly? Meaning that, you know, mm. when you go to buy alcohol, you have 40 percent on the bottle for spirits. You have 10 to 14 for wine. There's no concentration for cannabis that's a standard right now. So you're finding uh. that these higher and higher potency products, Allie, are making it to market and leaving it so the wild, wild west out there. What does this drug then that shows this promise actually do? How is it effective? <laughs> Yeah, so this, it's a really, really exciting, really promising compound. It, it works by blocking the effect of cannabis in the brain. The problem and the reason we don't have a drug for this so far is because when you block that receptor, you can get some pretty nasty side effects. And what these researchers have figured out for the first time ever is how to tweak that receptor a little bit so you don't get the nasty side effects, but you can block that sensation from getting high, that feel-good effect, so people actually use weed less. Dr. Akshay Sayal, thank you very much. Fascinating. That does it for us this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air with the suspect in the disappearance of Natalie Holloway back in the U.S., where Joran Vandersloot is now and what is next for him. We'll take you live to Alabama to get into these charges he's now facing. Plus, Spidey senses tingling over a potential Donald Trump indictment related to those classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago. We'll tell you what he's just saying in the last hour or so. Then we'll take you live to Philly and Montreal with that dangerous smoke now choking the Mid-Atlantic, making a mess of flights as the U.S. sends crews up to Canada Canada to try to fight these fires at their source. The big question, when's it going to get easier to breathe? Then President Biden and the UK Prime Minister going one on one to talk about helping Ukraine as that country finally launches this long awaited counteroffensive against Russia. We'll take you live to Ukraine and the reaction tonight from civil rights groups after a really surprising ruling from the Supreme Court that could play a big role in who controls the House of Representatives. We'll explain later. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and right now, Joran Vandersloot is in the United States, set to make his first ever court appearance in this country tomorrow. You're looking at a video of something that the family of Natalie Holloway has wanted to see for years. All right, this appears to show Joran Vandersloot, the man long suspected of having something to do with the now infamous disappearance of Holloway, getting off a plane in Alabama, we believe that's him there, getting into a car, heading to a jail not too far away in Alabama after being extradited from Peru. He'd been serving jail time there after being convicted of the murder of a different woman. The Holloway case is something people around the world have been following so closely for nearly two decades. And this video shows it, right? It shows how the attention is still laser focused on Vandersloot. That was the swarm of media as he was making his way to the Lima airport in Peru earlier. Thing is, here in the U.S., he is not facing murder charges. Nobody has ever been convicted in Holloway's death. Her body has never been found. Instead, Jorn Vandersloot's being accused of fraud. 
He's facing allegations that he got Holloway's mother to wire him $25,000 in exchange for information on where her daughter's body was, a promise that he supposedly never delivered on. Holloway's disappearance was the story of the year in 2005. She was last seen late at night in Aruba getting into a car with Vandersloot and two other men. Vandersloot had been arrested in connection to this alleged killing twice, but he was released both times for lack of evidence. NBC's Sam Brock is covering this for us live from Birmingham. Talk about next steps for Jorn Vandersloot here and what this moment means for the family of Natalie Holloway. They have been desperate for answers for decades. Yeah, the reality right now, Hatley, is that this family is finally going to get some closure, not in the sense of a murder conviction, but at least time behind bars, more than likely, for the individual who has been connected to the disappearance and death of her daughter, as you said, since 2005. And each of these two charges that you laid out, extortion and wire fraud for asking for $250,000 to provide information about their daughter's whereabouts, which never actually was furnished in a way they could act upon. In fact, it was worthless in the words of the Holloway family attorney. Um, those carry 20-year charges. And what you're looking at right now, extortion and wire fraud, if that happens, I asked the former U.S. attorney here uh, in Alabama, Joyce Vance, who now is an NBC News analyst, but she's the one that brought the charges to her office did. I asked what the likelihood is he'll be convicted. She said 100 percent because of the fact there's all this documentation of him asking for money in exchange for this information for a family, Hallie, that had already been traumatized. So next steps, that was the first part of your question. Tomorrow, there will be an arraignment here at 11 o'clock in the morning where he will reside before a judge. Um, and we'll see where things go from there. Is it possible, Sam, that if this does end up obviously going to trial, as I think the expectation is, I don't know that there's been any conversation about a plea out, although you'll tell us more. Is there any possibility that whatever comes out here related to this, as you say, extortion and fraud charge, could give more clues, could give any answers to Holloway's family here? Yeah, I don't know that there's a ton of optimism that that is going to happen. Okay. I will say this, however. He was right now until this extradition in jail in Peru for murdering a 21 year old woman, Stephanie Flores, and he pleaded guilty to that. Right. So he's already acknowledged that he is capable of murder. Now he comes back. He's going to spend the rest of his adult life or most of it serving out the rest of that sentence because they push pause, Hallie. Peruvian authorities say when he gets returned back to the country after these judicial proceedings are over, he's going to finish that through 2035 and then wow. face up to 40 years in the United States. So while his family may never have full closure in the sense of a murder conviction, this guy is almost certainly going to spend the rest of his adult life in a prison somewhere, either in South America or the United States. Can you pull back the curtain for us here, Sam, on what it's been like to be in Birmingham? We had Guad Venegas on this show 24 hours ago, live from Lima, where there was, again, this worldwide spotlight on Jorn Vandersloot and this extradition. Yeah. Can you give us a sense of what it's been like in town at this really significant moment in this case? It's been fascinating because we were out here reporting for a couple of days as well, and we were standing on a street corner very publicly where people were driving by or walking by every few minutes, and they would come up and say, what are you guys doing here? And when I explained what it was, their eyes would just light up because everyone has this sort of visceral memory of what those first few years were like in 2005, 2006, 2007. This dominated headlines in Birmingham, in the United States, internationally. It was everywhere. So the idea that Jorn Vandersloot is now back in Birmingham, people like could not wrap their mind around that idea because it had been so long. But yes, he is here and there is at least some sense not of satisfaction, but that it's finally come full circle and maybe there might be just a little bit of justice, semblance of justice in the words yeah. of Natalie Holloway's mother, Beth, that will be delivered here. Sam Brock live for us tonight in Birmingham, Alabama. Obviously all eyes on that arraignment tomorrow. We'll talk to you then, Sam. Appreciate it. To what we're calling indictment watch now. Because that's what it is. Shake up that magic eight ball and it'll probably say signs point to yes. Not a yes, but signs pointing to it that we may see an indictment now on federal charges for former President Donald Trump. We don't know yet specifically what those charges would be, but it would be, in theory, connected to the special counsel investigation that accuses him of knowingly taking classified documents out of the White House and back to his home in Mar-a-Lago. You may be thinking, okay, Hallie, why do you think that, right? Why is there this speculation? Why are there these signals? Here's one reason you're looking at it right now. This guy. This is one of the special counsel, Jack Smith's top deputies. His name is David Harbach. He's down at a Florida federal court, where we're just now hearing the grand jury is wrapping up for the day. Second signal. 
what you're seeing here now, that our team is hearing the Justice Department has told Mr. Trump that he's a target in this investigation. That matters. When you hear you're a target, it means prosecutors think you've done something wrong. You typically find out with a letter that might say, hey, come on down, talk to the grand jury, something Donald Trump is almost certainly not going to do. But people who get these letters often end up indicted or get indicted if they are going to be, whether or not they testify. Remember why we're here. Pictures like this one, the FBI finding hundreds of classified documents at the former president's Mar-a-Lago home last year, even though his lawyers said they gave them all back. So how is the former president responding today? He's calling it a boxes hoax. His words on a radio show just in the last hour or so. Plus, he's making this claim, totally unsubstantiated, we should note, against a Justice Department prosecutor that they maybe have been bribed. He's basing it off a right-wing website's report. NBC News cannot confirm that claim. I want to bring in Garrett Haik, who's joining us now live from Bedminster, New Jersey. We have laid out, Garrett, these signals. This is not speculation for the speck of, spe of, of speculation. There are informed reasons that all point to the potential for an indictment coming down soon. Fair? Yeah, I think that's totally fair, Hallie. And some of those signals are coming from basically everyone around Donald Trump that I and our team have been able to talk to in the last 36 hours or so. They all assume an indictment is coming. That's his you know, legal circle. That's his broader political circle, his allies on Capitol Hill. The big question for them is when. And they've been preparing the ground to make a political argument about it, much the same way they made a political argument about his first indictment in New York City. We heard very little, relatively speaking, from Donald Trump today either on social media or in interviews, but he did give us a taste of the political argument he's going to make in the future. In that radio uh, interview you mentioned earlier, I think it'd be useful for folks to hear what he's been saying. Listen to this. They're after me now. You know, they wait till you get out of office. They go after me, and it's, it's disgraceful when you look at what's happened. Over boxes, like a boxes hoax, they call it. The, this is a new one. So I guess the box is hoax is going to be the term, Hallie. But even in that interview, before that soundbite, he goes all the way back to the claims that, you know, the DOJ was spying on his campaign in 2015, 2016, tries to kind of run the linkage all the way through. The political argument Donald Trump's going to make here is abundantly clear that this is a kind of left wing, deep state, DOJ, however you want to describe it, effort to do what others can't, which is beat him politically. So there. He and his allies are very much in lockstep on that strategy. It's just a question of when they start deploying it, if and when they hear about an indictment. There has also been already, Garrett, as you all know, a preemptive defensive strategy, if not legally, then at least politically, as it relates to this idea of prosecutorial misconduct. Obviously, Donald Trump alluded to that in that post we mentioned a couple seconds ago. His ex-attorney yep. has been out talking about this. There's obviously no evidence to suggest that right now, but it does seem to be a clear indication of the direction or at least the thinking of those in Donald Trump's orbit. Yeah, I agree. Look, we have no idea if the interaction described here is true or not, but we know that Donald Trump's attorneys think it's true, or they at least think it's true enough to put it out there in a letter to the DOJ and to have the uh, candidate out there talking about it publicly. I think one way to think about this is you know, the Trump legal team and the political team have always felt that the DOJ has kind of fought unfairly on these cases. Remember, they pierced attorney-client privilege to get one of Trump's attorneys to testify in this case in the first place. They feel like the DOJ has been kind of like playing on the margins of the rules here, trying to use Donald Trump's own lawyers against them. This is Donald Trump's team saying, OK, you want to use our people against us? We're going to use your people against you and just kind of inject this into the public bloodstream. Again, we at NBC have no idea if this is true. The DOJ isn't commenting on it. I suspect it will get litigated both publicly and in a legal sense at some point, but it's the kind of thing that Trump can put out there publicly and his supporters can latch on to to say, see, this isn't fair as part of a political argument that he'll be making from now, probably till he's either reelected or knocked out of this presidential race. Garrett Haig, thank you very much. Live for us there in Bedminster. Appreciate it. So it is here back where I am in Washington and generally the Mid-Atlantic to PA in the bullseye of that thick smog. It's making the air unhealthy to breathe for nearly 100 million of us and it's tangling up flights for a second day in a row. Look how orange it is, upper left. That's Scranton, PA today. There's that haze in DC. You can barely see the memorial, the monuments on the mall. You can see Baltimore, Maryland too. Everybody facing code red or code purple or even code maroon. That's the worst one. That just means straight up hazardous.
Take a live look at Philly, right, the skyline there, where the air quality today hit the worst that it's been since the city actually started keeping records. The airport there has just lifted some of the delays that were affecting flights coming in. D.C. schools calling off anything outside. New York schools will go remote tomorrow because of how bad it is. The Smithsonian National Zoo is closed. Some, but not all, baseball games are canceled. The White House postponed its outdoor pride celebration. Some airlines are now trying to waive change fees. They're letting people for free push back flights to or from the airports you see here. All those airports dealing with major delays. And you can see the region we're talking about here, right? From just about Virginia up to Ohio through the Northeast. With the focus now turning to fighting this air quality issue at its source. Those huge wildfires up in Canada. You see them here. They just do not seem to be getting better. And Canada needs help, needs more resources to be able to get a handle on this. President Biden today says he wants any available federal firefighting help to help battle those fires in Canada. And he wants the government to monitor air quality and air traffic. We have George Solis live for us in Philadelphia. Vanessa Lee from our partner CTV in Canada in Montreal. Meteorologist Bill Cairns is joining us too. George, to you first. Gross air quality in a place that I know and love well, which is the city of Philadelphia, right? It's apparently the worst it's been in a couple of decades. We see it out the window behind you. I think if you flipped your camera, we'd see all the delays at the airport, right? It's a mess. Yeah, it's a big mess, Hallie. I mean, the only thing that really comes to mind when you think about how this morning and how these last few days have progressed, uh, deep purple smoke on the water, right? Fire in the sky, because everywhere you look, you see that smoke that blankets the area. You see the orange haze along the skylines, particularly yesterday in Manhattan when you saw that glow eerily uh, taking over here in Philadelphia. You can't even see Billy Penn, Boathouse Row, the Schuylkill, all of it gone. The only upside to some of this is that the air quality is somewhat starting to improve. It is still very dangerous, and that is why we have seen many people transition to those face coverings. And a lot of people that I I've talked to say this does feel very reminiscent of the pandemic, especially here at the airport. But people are taking the precautions seriously because they know this health isn't just impacting those with pre existing health conditions, the elderly, young children. This is dangerous for anyone to be in. And so, here in the city of Philadelphia, they've suspended non essential services, trash pickup. You mentioned schools going virtual. Philadelphia schools just announced that they'll be going virtual tomorrow. Ah, some graduations okay. are being shifted. Some are no longer going to be uh, outdoors. So obviously people are heeding the warnings of this air quality that, again, getting better, but still not out of the woods yet. As I mentioned, I talked to some people here at the airport earlier today who were fortunately not uh, made late by any delays or cancellations, but they are still very worried about this air quality, not just here, but as they travel across the country. Take a listen to what they told me. It's pretty bad. As soon as I walk outside, I can feel my eyes getting irritated. It smells like campfire everywhere I go. This is the first time I've worn a mask since we had to for the uh, pandemic. The air quality is just so bad today. That Hey, think about that. For many people, it's like reliving the past, having to wear their masks again. But when you again, you have air quality this bad. I mean, I was outside for a few minutes and almost instantly my eyes started watering. And so you look at the skyline here in Philly, you see that it's still pretty hazy out there. Many hoping that by the weekend it looks a lot better. But with these wildfires still burning, many wonder if there will see an improvement or if it's just going to keep getting worse like this uh, over the summer. So obviously we are keeping a very close eye on conditions, Hallie. George Solis live for us there in Philly. Thank you very much. We talked about the source of where this issue is in the first place. It's those wildfires in Canada. Vanessa Lee of our partner CTV in Montreal is taking a look at what they're doing to try to get a handle on this. Watch. There are currently 133 fires raging in Quebec with more than half out of control. This has affected at least 11,000 people who have been forced to flee their homes. Officials say their focus today is on a village seven hours north of Montreal. It's called Normetal. It's a small community of 800 people where flames are literally at their doorstep, just 500 meters away. And so all efforts are being made right now to save this small community. The concern, of course, is when people will be able to go home. A couple of days ago, 7,500 people from the town of Shibugamo were evacuated. And really, it happened very quickly. 
The town councilor was told at five o'clock that the town would be safe. And just a couple of hours later, they were told they had to leave, that they started banging on people's doors, telling them to leave immediately. And they don't know when they'll be able to go back because there is no rain in the forecast until next Tuesday. It's unprecedented to see so many fires this early in the season. So far in Quebec, there have been 444 fires. Normally at this time of the season, it's only about 200. There are 800 firefighters right now on the ground across the province with more help on the way from abroad. There are firefighters coming from the U.S., from Spain, Portugal and France. And the reason they're coming from so far away is because there have been so many fires right across Canada that most provinces can't spare the resources. And there are fears over what's to come, considering summer hasn't even arrived yet. Vanessa Lee in Montreal for NBC News. Let's get to meteorologist Bill Karens now. And you know the question of the hour, Bill. When can we breathe safely again? When's this going to be over? Yeah, I think we'd all like this story to be over with, uh, especially when we get to the weekend, too. Enough events have already been canceled. So for the first time in about 48 hours, I'm not finding any locations that are in what we call the very unhealthy category. So earlier we had places in, that were hazardous, especially in Pennsylvania, uh, southern Pennsylvania. And then we were in a lot of areas around D.C. were in the very unhealthy. Now we just have unhealthy. <laughs> so it's getting slowly better. Not good, but slowly better. So the areas of red are where that unhealthy areas from Scranton, Harrisburg, PA, all the way down I-95 towards Richmond. And the specific numbers, earlier today, we were seeing numbers that were close to 400, uh, especially in Pennsylvania. Those have come way down. State College is now at 94. Pittsburgh's at 71. That's good. New York's holding. Hasn't really been dropping. Still about 160. And that's still, you know, if it wasn't for yesterday, that would still be considered unusually high for New York City. So this is kind of three days in a row with very unhealthy air. D.C. still at 172. And then air Areas in the Ohio Valley, get used to seeing smoke because we're going to see periods of it. Not the dense stuff like New York had, but uh, Detroit right now is in unhealthy. It's Columbus, even as far west as areas like Chicago. So here's the snow forecast. As we go through the night tonight, the source continues to throw smoke at the Great Lakes. Notice Detroit and Cleveland. You should wake up with a smoky sunrise. Pittsburgh to Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. tomorrow morning. Still probably in the red for unhealthy air quality. And then during the day, that plume just kind of sits in the same location here. New York's northward should be good on Friday afternoon but that area from Pittsburgh to DC and across the areas of Western Maryland that's where we're gonna still see smoke even Saturday morning that continues and by the time we get to Saturday afternoon still DC to Philly so you know this isn't kind of what you wanted me to tell you but it's gonna last a while Hallie yeah I wish you had said something different Bill I think it's so interesting I think a lot of people don't think about you forecasting smoke they think about you forecasting rain or tornadoes or hurricanes or whatever yeah. but this is a part of your reality now when there's a hurricane Bill you and I are talking about it five days out there is some criticism now um, from critics of the leadership in New York City saying hey maybe you should have been warning this about this sooner. Maybe you should have been sounding the alarm about this sooner. Is that even a possibility in instances like this? Help us understand this. I'll give you an example. My kids came up to me and they said, you know, we canceled school for a couple inches of snow, but they send us to school when we're breathing in these things that are going to harm us, like, you know, personally, like in our body. So, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of people are kind of saying that. We did know that this big, huge plume of smoke was coming about 24 hours ahead of time. But it's, it hasn't happened in this region. So it's kind of like one of those things where people have to see it before they believe it. And after this, there probably will be protocols like areas on the West Coast have for schools and government of what happens when you have wildfire smoke. But because of this event, uh, it'll change a lot of people's plans in the east. And I know, Hallie, one of those also things you always wonder about, and a lot of people do too, is the climate change connection to worsening wildfires. Well, we're at an incredible pace. You just saw the story there. Um, it's only you know, getting into the middle of June, and they, they've almost had a full season worth of fires in Canada already. So one thing we know about wildfires and about the climate connection Warmer planet dries the soil out more. Just makes more sense. If the planet's warmer and the soil is more dry, a fire can burn more. So they're saying that a study went back to 1986 all the way to 2021, and about 40% of the total acres burned, they could actually link it to climate change. That's how much additional burned because of the warming that's been done to this planet. And if you're wondering about how much acreage that is, it ends up being about the whole size of South Carolina burning. That's why we made that comparison. So as far as climate change impacts, warming temperatures, decreasing humidity, they both combine to dry up that vegetation. That's the connection, Hallie. Would this fire have happened without climate change? Yes, but it was probably worse.
Bill Karens, thank you very much. Appreciate that. I know we'll be on this story for a little while longer. Yeah, appreciate it. So listen, some pretty intense fighting in Ukraine as the country launches what people have been talking about for weeks, if not longer. This long-awaited counteroffensive against Russia. Basically, this is Ukraine stepping up its attacks against the Kremlin's invasion. You can see on this map here, right, everything in red, that's what Russian forces occupy right now. Ukraine wants it back. That's why they're launching this bigger push to get that territory. It's all happening is back here in Washington. These two leaders, President Biden and the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, are meeting today to talk about, in part, getting more military help to Ukraine. Listen. I believe we'll have the funding necessary to support Ukraine as long as it takes. And uh, I believe that uh, we're going to, that, that support will be real, even though there are, you hear some voices today on Capitol Hill about whether or not we should continue. Ali Raffa will join us from the, just outside the White House with more in just a sec, but I want to get right to Raf Sanchez, who is in Ukraine for us tonight. A pivotal moment, Raf, a key moment in this counteroffensive. We're in it now. Where does it go? A key moment, Hallie, and a major, major test for Ukraine. The Ukrainian forces are flush with Western weapons. They have spent months planning, training, preparing for this counteroffensive. But this may also be really their bat last best chance to make significant gains on the battlefield. A senior Ukrainian officer and a soldier near the front lines here in Zaporizhia tells us the counteroffensive is underway. They would not go into detail about where exactly Ukraine is attacking, what their objectives are. But we do know that some of the most intense fighting is happening east of where we are, further on into Zaporizhia. It appears there, according to analysts we have spoken to, that for the first time, Ukraine is sending Western battle tanks into combat. Yeah. These are these German-made Leopard 2 tanks. And that is a sign of how seriously they are taking it, that they are finally, after months of holding them back, deploying their best weapons onto the battlefield. Hallie? How does that dam collapse play into this counteroffensive push, if at all, Raf? So the Ukrainians have been saying all week that even as they deal with this humanitarian and environmental disaster all across southern Ukraine, they will not allow it to interfere with the counteroffensive. And they appear to be delivering on that promise. Remember, Ukraine says the Russians blew up this dam on the Dnieper River to try to prevent this counteroffensive from going forward, stop Ukrainian troops crossing the river, create absolute chaos. The Russians are denying that they are responsible. We have not yet heard the U.S. weigh in definitively one way or another, but U.S. officials say the intelligence is leaning towards Russia being responsible. And Hallie, this evacuation effort in the city of Kherson still underway. As it happens, rescuers there are under fire from Russian units on the other side of the river. President Zelensky also making a visit to Kherson today. That is not a trip without risk for the president of Ukraine. Just a couple of hours after yeah. he was at one of these evacuation points, it was shelled there. They say they've evacuated about 2,000 people from the Ukrainian-controlled side of the river, but they're very worried about civilians in Russian-occupied areas who Ukraine says are basically being left to fend for themselves. Allie. Raf Sanchez, live for us there in Ukraine. Raf, thank you. I want to bring in Ali Rafa now. And Ali, you know, and it threw me for a sec because the monument is so hazy behind you there. But on this topic of Ukraine, this topic of this key moment, as I talked about with Raf, this is the backdrop to this meeting in Washington between the president and the prime minister. Um, a, a critical visual at a critical time of these two allies, allies of Ukraine and the show of force. Yeah, absolutely, Hallie. And you played at the top there the part of the president's speech when he acknowledged those members of Congress who have basically pumped the brakes on sending more aid to Ukraine, essentially saying, you know, let's take a step back here. Let's consider how much longer we could afford uh, to send this level of aid, this level of uh, financial and military aid. And that's been a big question for months now. How, if at all, uh, could the level of support for Ukraine change as its strategy changes? 
especially today, as you heard Ralph, uh, Ralph lay out, you know, how that counteroffensive has begun. And so in this speech, the president uh, really dismissed the, that opposition, those doubts, saying that uh, he does think that the U.S. can afford uh, to continue supporting Ukraine for, he says, quote, as long as it takes, because he essentially says there's no other option. Take, the, take a listen to that part of his speech. I asked people a picture of what would happen if we were not supporting Ukraine. Do we think Russia would stop in Kyiv? Do you think that's all there would be happening? Uh, I think not, and I think the vast majority of my colleagues, even the critics, uh, think that would not be the case as well. And Prime Minister Rishi Sunak backed the president on that. He acknowledged that the U.S. has been the number one contributor of aid to Ukraine since this war began over a year ago. But he also said uh, that there is a, a need to share this burden. There are still other NATO countries who could step it up, including the U.K., and uh, take on more financial and military responsibility. We know that uh, the U.K. plans to start training Ukrainian pilots, similar uh, to uh, what the United States has been doing for the last few months. Uh, but that level of support, how, if at all, do, do other European countries, other NATO allies take on more support? How much more they take on is something that we're definitely going to be keeping an eye on, especially with the next uh, NATO summit coming up just a month away now in Lithuania. Ali Rafa live for us there in Washington. Ali, thank you. Coming up here on the show, an FDA panel just voting to recommend a possibly life-saving drug for babies. What happens next in The Five Things? Plus, why one Spider-Man superstar says it'll be a while before you see him on screen again. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, an FDA panel just voting to recommend a shot that would help prevent RSV in babies. It would protect infants up to two years old. It's injectable. It's similar to a vaccine, but instead of a long-term immunity, it just gives more of a temporary resistance. The FDA still has to actually approve it, but they'll probably follow the committee's recommendation. This would be a huge deal because right now there's really not much parents can do about RSV. Number two, the Vatican says Pope Francis is in good condition after that three-hour surgery to fix a hernia. He rested extensively, they say. Rested quite a bit last night. He was alert and breathing on his own today. He'll spend a few more days in the hospital while he recovers. Number three, El Nino has arrived for the first time in about four years, according to NOAA, which says the weather pattern will get stronger over the next couple months. What does it mean? What does El Nino mean for you? Get ready for it to get hot. The potential for record temperatures. When we're in an El Nino period, it typically means fewer hurricanes in the Gulf, in Florida, or near Florida, but more hurricanes over for the Pacific Coast. Number four, actor Tom Holland says he's going to take a break from acting for a year. He, of course, is the star of Spider-Man. Tell an extra the production of his upcoming Apple TV Plus show was so difficult it broke him. He starred in and produced the series called The Crowded Room. It comes out tomorrow. Number five, the Supreme Court siding with Jack Daniels in a trademark fight over a dog toy with a poop theme that looks just like a Jack Daniels bottle. It's called Bad Spaniel. And the company that makes it says it's obviously a parody. They're like, we don't really think that we're selling Jack Daniels bottles. The Supreme Court said otherwise in a unanimous nine zip ruling. Also out of the Supreme Court, very different case for civil rights and voting rights activists, activists rather, celebrating after this, in some ways, right, a modest celebration after a twist from the Supreme Court, striking down congressional maps in Alabama, which opponents said basically scaled back the power of black voters in the state. This is a five to four decision. You can see a couple of the more conservative justices on the court siding with the more liberal justices in this. It backs the landmark 1965 Voting Rights Act after we saw some recent rulings where this more conservative-leaning court struck down parts of it. So what does this mean for Alabama? They have to go back to the drawing board now. They've got to give black voters more say in the state's elections, seeing as black people make up more than a quarter of the state's population. NBC's Julia Ainsley joins me now. And two big pieces to this, right? It's a twist. It was a surprise. People didn't expect it. But more importantly, the court basically said, no, Alabama, you did dilute the power of the black vote. And you can't do that. That's right. And going forward, what this means is that the bar is not raised. When states try to gerrymander and rig these voting maps so that they dilute any population, they no longer have to be intentional about being racist. And anyone who's challenging them, they don't have to prove that those maps were intentionally racist. They just have to have the effect 
of racism. That's a big deal for people who are challenging voting maps in their states going forward. I was just going to ask then, does this open the door perhaps to more optimism on the part of people who are bringing those challenges? They don't necessarily have quite as high a bar to prove. Yes, I mean, there is some good news, but I think we should also have a grain of salt here. There's a line today that we saw in the majority opinion that did strike my eye where they said that Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, that's what they're upholding, yep. may impermissibly elevate race in the allocation of political power within the United States. In other words, they don't want to get carried away here. They are going to uphold it in this case, and they do think that Alabama was in violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, but they don't want to elevate race past the point where they would deem it permissible. So what does Alabama have to do now? So now they've got to go back to the drawing board, as you said, and they have to listen to groups like the black voters yeah. that challenged this and other voters that challenged it. And they now need to have them give them a voice when they're coming up with these different maps. Pull back a little bit because it's not just Alabama, right? The court is looking at a lot that has to do with race, that has to do with voting rights. What is the landscape here? Yeah, it was really interesting today because as some are breathing a sigh of relief, there's still a number of decisions coming forward that do have to do with voting that could still go the other way. Also, looking back, I mean, we know in 2013, the Supreme Court released 15 states from federal oversight of voting laws. They upheld Arizona's voting restrictions. Right. There are a lot of ways looking back that this court often led by our current Chief Justice John Roberts, did actually roll back the clock on some of those voting rights that were in place. Julia Ainsley, thank you very much. Thanks, Hallie. I appreciate the breakdown. When we come back, a relatively new debate that has a lot of Americans super divided. We've got those new numbers out tonight coming up. A new national poll out today shows just how sharply divided Americans are over gender identity, showing nearly two-thirds of Americans believe there are simply two identities, man and woman. The numbers, if you look based on the political divide, are fairly stark. 90% of Republicans agree, 66% of independents, 44% of Democrats. Let's bring in Erin Gilchrist for more on this. And there may be people going, well, wait a second, I don't understand this, right? Why is this even a conversation? What do people say about this? And how did the divide get so deep? We talked to a couple of experts about this. And part of it is, is that there hasn't really been yeah, decades of conversation around this. So it's sort of new for some people to even be talking about this. But for this particular survey, you know, they sort of explained it as this is where political affiliation plays a role, mm -hmm. trust in news sources plays a role, and generation, you know, what generation you're in plays a role in terms of how people responded to these questions. And these experts we talked to kind of pointed to this intersection of politics and, and culture and religion uh, around these LGBTQ issues in particular, and the notion that we're sort of born with this understanding of gender norms, right? At least for generations, that's been the case. And, and if we're not born with it, you're sort of socialized into it. And the idea being, right, I mean, I think that we've got to just say clearly here, sex and gender being yeah. two different things. Right, and, and that's a whole other conversation. Right, exactly. Yeah, yes, right. But, but around gender identity now, we, we are having conversations in a way that we did not 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And, you know, if you look at some of the numbers from this survey, the fact that you've got 65% uh, of, of people saying there are just two genders, that means you've got 35 35 percent of people who are saying, no, there's there's more room for this part of the conversation. The spectrum. Right. right. So politics plays a part of it. And then there's this idea that there are some people who are saying, you know what, this is a much more complex thing than two genders. And so there's more conversation to be had around it. There's more understanding. I want you to hear what how one of our experts put it uh, in terms of explaining how we got to the sort of space that we are in now. Those of us in universities and perhaps in media are a little bit more familiar uh, with these topics and issues, but a lot of Americans are encountering them for the first time, and um, the, the issues around um, gender and gender identity are big ones, and people are trying to make sense of them. So people are trying to make sense of it. There are some people in, in this professor's estimation who, who are not able to or willing to have the conversation and try to understand sort of what the possibilities are around gender identity. And then there are others who are saying, yeah, let's have the conversation. There's an opportunity for some people to learn, to be educated about what 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 the what, gender spectrum is right. and what and that looks like. Exactly. Right. And, and that's partly because of Gen Z that's out there saying, hey, you know what, yeah. there's more conversation to be had, let's do it. Uh, and they're helping to sort of drive that conversation uh, in a way that we hadn't seen with previous generations. That's a great point on the generational aspect of it. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you very much. Yeah. Good to see you. You too.
And tonight, right here on NBC News Now, 1030 Eastern, do not miss our all-new special hosted by Joe Fryer called Pride 2023 Out Front, highlighting trailblazers who are changing the conversation on LGBTQ plus representation and acceptance. Must watch. Coming up, new details tonight about something that the French president, Emmanuel Macron, says has his nation in shock. That's later on in The Global. So Google is planning to crack down on employees who haven't been coming into the office regularly, according to some reporting first out from CNBC. Apparently, Google has now updated its hybrid work policy to include tracking your attendance in the office through your badge. They're going to confront people who aren't showing up when they're supposed to. And if you mess up any of your attendance, like if you work from home when you're supposed to be in, that's going to go on your performance review, according to these internal memos viewed by CNBC. The chief people officer at Google, a.k.a. their, like, top HR person, says there's just no substitute for coming together in person. This push to return to the office has probably been in your group chats and your side slacks at some point. Even Martha Stewart's been talking about it. Listen. I cannot really stomach another Zoom, you know, Zoom here, Zoom there. Uh, It just doesn't get the work done in the right way. Now, we're, our, our, our office is on a three-day work week, uh-huh. and, and I just don't agree with it. Jake Moore joins us now. Fine, Jake. On the one side, Google and Martha Stewart. On the other side, a ton of employees who are like, I don't care if you don't like Zoom. This is working for my life. What's interesting about this Google move is that we've seen so far, if you think about carrots and sticks, lots of carrots to get people to come back to the office. The ice cream truck, the happy hour, Right. Google's pulling out the stick. I think that's absolutely right, Hallie. You know, and, and Martha probably runs a hell of a Zoom meeting, but but there, you know, it's not at all <laughs> clear uh, the degree to which these companies uh, can actually bring these people back and keep them motivated. But they certainly can bring them back. You know, uh, the, what we're seeing here from this internal reporting uh, that's come out of CNBC, which got its hands on internal memos there, you know, really shows that Google is trying to wind the clock back at least to some extent toward February 2020, the last time that we were all working a, a normal life. Uh, they want people in the office for that three-day-a-week policy, and they're prepared to start uh, some enforcement on it. You know, uh, we've seen this, of course, uh, from other companies. Uh, you know, we have uh, Meta last week announcing that by September, people should really be committed to their three-day-a-week schedule. Elon Musk at Twitter is famously hostile to working from home. He's been open about it. But even Mark Benioff, the head of Salesforce, who once upon a time was all for it and told people they could work wherever they wanted, is now talking about wanting new employees to be in the office at least four days a week. So there's just this general sense that companies here in San Francisco and around the country are trying to wind the clock back to something like the life we used to live. Is there any data to support the idea that being in person can help companies collaborate? I was struck by something that that Google chief people officer said, which was an acknowledgement that nobody thinks that these magical hallway meetings are really going to sprinkle fairy dust on everything, right? But she was pointing to basically saying, yeah, there are actual benefits to this. Do we know that that's the case from a data perspective? You know, we do know that there is, uh, at least from a pure, like, t- getting tasks done perspective, the organizational psychologists would all tell you that there's pretty good evidence that putting people together, making sure they have relationships, and sticking them on tasks together makes them more productive than having them at a distance from one another. But the other, you know, the, the more progressive sort of hybrid uh, experts that I've been speaking to also say that we are just beginning to figure out how to make a hybrid uh, system work. Out. It may not be that you want to sit on a Zoom with Martha day in and day out, but it may be that there are other ways to get people together in a hybrid format that makes them just as effective, maybe more effective. We know, of course, that it cuts a huge amount of time and expense out of people's right. lives to keep them from having to commute into the office. But I think a lot of the senior management pushing back toward this thing has to do with the fact that most of the established research is about working in person, and that's probably what they're basing this decision on. I don't know if you would have the answer to this, Jake, but I do wonder what there could be relating to legal pushback on something like this, right? In other words, do employee protections Mm -hmm. extend to the hybrid workplace if, in fact, your company told you you could do that now they shift their position? Could a worker fight that? Like, I don't know, because the answer could also be, well, find another job. That's your other option. 
Well, this is really interesting. I mean, I think, yes, you probably could see some legal challenges if you have some sort of signed document that you, that says, you know, you get to work from anywhere from now on. Google made that sort of offer to lots and lots of people during the pandemic yeah. and allowed them to go work in any place they wanted to. That's part of why that chief people officer's email is, in fact, uh, saying to people who took that kind of arrangement and signed that kind of deal that she hopes you will reconsider the arrangement. <laughs> and uh, internally, another memo is there says that Google has the right to reconsider the arrangement depending on what kind of values they have. But yeah, that could absolutely wind up in court if somebody decided to press it, Hallie. Jake Ward in our San Francisco office tonight. Jake, thank you. I think. Jake, thank you very much. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here is some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Australia, the government is planning some bills to ban swastikas and other Nazi symbols. Its attorney general says there's been a rise in far-right activity there. Nazi symbols are already banned in most Australian states, but a federal law would take it further by banning any trade of this stuff. Not clear when it might go into effect. Out of France, police are telling NBC News the suspect's in custody after an awful knife attack in the Alps. Officials say the attacker stabbed four little kids and two adults. Some of them were seriously hurt. The French president says the nation is in shock. The prosecutor says there's still a big question mark around motive, but that it does not appear to be terror-related. And out of Ethiopia, we are learning tonight the U.S. is suspending food help to that country. Why? Because of a big review that found a widespread and coordinated campaign to divert the food away from people there, meaning it is not reaching the people who need it most. USAID tells NBC News in a statement, we made the difficult but necessary decision that we cannot move forward with the distribution of food assistance until reforms are in place. This is bad news for people who need help in Ethiopia because the U.S. is the biggest humanitarian aid donor to the country. I want to bring in Matt Bradley for more details on this. Hey, Matt, good evening. Hey, yeah, Hallie, you know, just to give you a sense of how big this decision is and why when, you know, when we hear from USAID officials, it sounds like such a wrenching, difficult decision. Ethiopia is the second largest country in Africa. It's got 120 million people. About a sixth of those, 20 million people, require food aid at some time. And, you know, about 12 million of those 20 million get it from the United States. The United States is by far the largest donor of food aid to um, uh, to Ethiopia. And, you know, we're talking about more than, I think it's about $1.5 billion worth of aid. Two-thirds of that from the United States goes just to food. Now, most of this was going toward a region in the north of the country called the Tigray region, which has endured a two-year-long civil war with the central government uh, in Ethiopia. Now, this has been the deadliest war in recent memory, not Ukraine. But in Ethiopia, in the Tigray region, that's where we've seen 600,000 people dying during that two-year war. Now, that ended back in November. But there's still a desperate situation there and really throughout the country because it's not just the civil war that's been raging for so long and killing so many people, along with you know, massive human rights abuses, uh, armies using food as a weapon, and even weaponized rape. Those tragedies laid over top an environmental tragedy, one of the most enduring and powerful droughts that has hit that entire region for the past several seasons. And that is, you know, really causing a massive lack of food, not just in Ethiopia, but also in neighboring countries. Now, pile on top of that, Hallie, you're talking about refugees pouring in from two other countries on either sides of Ethiopia. Somalia, which has been fighting a stubborn uh, insurrection against the Al-Shabaab militia group. Refugees are pouring in from that failed state into Ethiopia. And then on the other side, Sudan, where we've seen a month-long uh, fight between the two major government military groups. Alongside that, there was fighting in South Sudan and fighting in the Western Darfur region. So that country is also producing a refugee burden for Ethiopia. So now... On top of all of that, we're seeing the United States pulling out of its food aid because they simply don't know where the food aid is going. And they're describing in these investigations that USAID has been conducting some of the most widespread fraud and corruption that they've had to see in a long time. And they haven't really been able to lay exactly blame on who is responsible, but they say that this is coordinated at the highest federal government level and with local officials, and that a lot of this is going to benefit the military at the expense of the civilians who need this food aid most. So again, we're talking about tens of millions of people who are going to be affected in a country that really relies on U.S. food aid. Hallie? Matt Bradley, thank you very much for that important reporting. Appreciate it.
Coming up, there's a new kind of drug experts say could treat an addiction that sometimes flies a little under the radar. We'll talk about how it works and what cannabis addiction even looks like anyway. Coming up. A new experimental drug tonight shows some positive results for treating cannabis addiction. And you may be thinking, well, wait a second, what even is cannabis addiction? How do you do that in the first place? Because oftentimes people think, well, that's not really something that happens with pot. Well, there sure is such thing as cannabis addiction. And experts say there's a need to do something about it because 14 million Americans struggle with what's called cannabis use disorder in 2021, according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. This comes at a time when 23 states, plus D.C. and Guam, have legalized recreational cannabis, making it more widely available. Dr. Akshay Sal is joining us now. So let me first start. Let's set aside the, the cannabis addiction piece. Let's start with this drug. Why is it so promising? Why are we even talking about this new drug in the first place? Yeah, so Hallie, did you know there are no FDA-approved treatments for cannabis use disorder mm. right now? A, a disorder that's affecting 14 million people across the country, and there's really no effective treatments for it. Um, and so that's what makes it so exciting. And the reason it's promising, Hallie, is because, uh, you know, the reason we don't have, or part of the reason we don't have a treatment for this uh, is because previous drugs that we've tried, when you try to block the way cannabis or marijuana works in the brain, it can lead to nasty side effects like mood disorders and even suicidal ideation, meaning thoughts of suicide. I mean, so what makes this drug so different is that it can actually go to that receptor and instead of totally blocking it, it can just tweak it a little bit um, so it can prevent you from getting high, um, while avoiding those nasty side effects that have made this such a difficult disorder to treat in the past. So that's the drug. What about the addiction piece itself? Because it seems like there's sometimes this stereotype, like, well, you can't get addicted to weed. Like, that's not a thing that happens. It actually is a thing that happens. Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. Contrary to popular belief, you can actually develop an addiction to marijuana. This is something that, you know, anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of people who use marijuana develop a cannabis use disorder, a marijuana use disorder. And so what do we mean by that? The key really here is when you're using so much marijuana that it's starting to interfere with your life in terms of, you know, you're struggling with work and school, you're, you're ch having trouble maintaining relationships, um, you're giving up things that you used to do, maybe some hobbies like you used to play an instrument or play a sport that you're not just finding you can't do anymore because you, you, you're needing to keep going back and back to that cannabis, and that's when it becomes a problem, Hallie. Um, can you talk through the legalization aspect here, right? Because there are substances, like for example, there is such thing as alcohol abuse, and alcohol is legal. It is a legal substance to be sold, right? So in other words, something that has the potential to be abused doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to be legalized. W where does that discussion stand in the medical community? Yeah, I think most people that I've talked to in the medical community, you know, they're pretty for legalization. I think the caveat here is we need to be smart about this and we need to do this in a proper way. And I'll give you an example. You know, when you go to a liquor store to buy a bottle of wine or, or whiskey, you can see the percent of alcohol that's in the bottle, whether it's 40 percent in, in spirits or 10 to 15 with wine. With marijuana, we don't really have any regulation like that. And what we're seeing over the decades is that the, the, the marijuana that our kids are using today is not the, what their parents were smoking. It's, it's way more potent and that can lead to more addiction and more mental health effects. Dr. Akshay Sayal, thank you so much for that breakdown. Appreciate it. That's a wrap for us for this hour. Top Story picks up our coverage right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.